by the name of Ogden Nash, who wrote a, wrote a poem that I'm not going to say poetically because it doesn't quite work uh, quite as well as you read it, but it's about a gentleman by the name of Cloud who was the eternal optimist. Everything was good, everything was going to work right, everything was perfect. And it drove his wife absolutely crazy. She didn't quite have the same attitude. She could not handle his sunny optimism all that time. Which was really too bad. So according to the poem, uh, Mrs. McLeod decided she was going to take it out on Mr. McLeod. And uh, she melted down her silver tea set and snuck it into a drink and had him drink it, thinking that might just do him in. Well, it didn't. He survived, and he came away with this statement in his usual cheery attitude, now I'm a, cl I'm a cloud lined with silver. It's supposed to be funny. We have to put a positive spin on things sometimes. Uh, we can be concerned about all sorts of things in life. Actually, I just heard a, just heard a concern. Just, uh, as we were singing that last song, I was back there and uh, the uh, bird children ran up to me and uh, they, they came up and said that uh, they were going to the zoo tomorrow and that their dad was going to get locked up in the donkey cage. <laughs> I don't know if we need to be worried about you, Joe. You can make your own opinions about me. <laughs> <laughs> we might see if it's a worry or not. Psalm 111 is a, a song about gratitude and teaching. It's an easy, interesting little psalm because it was written kind of late in the Old Testament history. And it is written in such a way that it was, it was meant to be an easy to remember psalm and a teachable psalm. Now this is a period of time where the, the Hebrew people are coming back from a period of exile. And uh, they've gone through a, a time in which nobody received any sort of education or anything like that. And so it's written almost like an ABC type song. First line, poem, starts not really with the letter A, but they're equivalent. Second letter with a B, third letter with a C, and it goes on like that. A lot of the, the writing that they did in that period of time was written like that because on top of trying to teach some, some lessons about who is God, they're also just trying to get back a, a basic understanding of how to read and write and try to come up with an easy way to remember the psalm. It's a time of high illiteracy and a little biblical understanding, and so they're trying to teach the people about these things. It's going to become important a little later in the psalm. Okay, so you have to remember that. One, letter, one line starts with an A, B, C. Okay. Remember that for a few minutes. We're going to start, actually, as we go through this psalm with the last verse. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. Fear of the Lord. Full understanding of who God is in his greatness. This week, uh, there was an event that occurred way far away. In fact, off of our planet, up in the sun, in which huge tons of hydrogen escaped from the sun and then this huge cosmic blast of energy as the, the fires of the sun caught off with these tons of hydrogen that escaped. Waves of radiation that were sent out to lash against the earth that could be very dangerous, can even wasn't for protection in the atmosphere, would have wiped out all of our electronics. Very dangerous, but they caused beautiful northern lights. And if you got up at two or three in the morning, could have gone out and, and seen the northern lights dancing in the sky. Kind of in some ways how we need to look at God, a fierce, untamable God. But when we understand him, we see great beauty. It should cause delight in our hearts to fully understand 
who God is. But there's, there's this power. And because there's this power, this majesty, we understand ourselves in proper respect to God. In fact, doing this sermon series in September that's kind of related to what we're going to look about today, we're going to take it from the point of view of humility. And humility is, is understanding ourselves properly in light of who God is. It's really what humility is. We're going to spend about five weeks defining what humility is. But the bottom line is going to come to this. It's basically understanding, here is God, here is me, here's how I relate to him. It becomes critical in our understanding the world. Because I am in one place, God is in another, and I need to understand who God is, and I need to understand how desperately I need Him. How desperately I need His love. He is a fearsome God, in whose love I delight. And that is the beginning place of wisdom. Wisdom is the proper way to see the world. And we practice how we live based on here is who God is. And so I keep a proper understanding of God so I can live right in a world of distractions. I read a story this week. It was written by a man named uh, Donald Barnholm. wrote a book about uh, Romans. And he tells a story. And in this story, there is a young man, he kind of starts to develop feelings for a young lady, starts to turn into kind of a passion for her. This was in the days around the beginning of World War II, and he ends up going off to war, and he goes for a couple of years, and he comes back, and he meets a different young. And at the end of the war, he falls in love with her. And they get married. And very quickly thereafter, as a lot of soldiers did when they came back from war, there was a baby pretty quick thereafter. His wife and baby go out to see her mother knock on the door. It's that first girl that he had a crush on. First girl passionate about. Wasn't sure what to do, but he invited her in, and it became very clear very quickly that she was flirting with him. That she was there for the taking, I suppose you could say. And he didn't know what to do. I mean, there's temptation right in front of him. And what he did, first thing he did was he pulled out his wallet. He realized she was flirting with him. Hey, have you seen my wife? Oh, isn't she pretty? Isn't she beautiful? She didn't quite give up so easily, and he started to say, you know, my wife, she is the most patient person. And he starts to run through a list of things that he was grateful for about his wife. And just starts listing off all the things that she had done good for him. And it led to gratitude, it led to a proper understanding of his relationship with his wife. And eventually, this young lady took the hint and said, you know, your love for her is pretty powerful. And she ended up leaving. That is exactly what we should do, right? We should be, I think a lot of issues in marriage would be taken care of if we just learn to be grateful for our spouse. But... This is even more so than that. It is a picture of our relationship with God. Because as we learn to be grateful for the things that God has given us, it's amazing how the distractions of the world and the things that we think we desperately need seem to melt away. Psalm 111 is kind of like that, this learning to follow God through gratitude, through worship, through 
We're saying the right things to ourselves sometimes over and over again becomes important. So we're going to look through the other nine verses of this. It starts off in verse 1. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. I'm going to gather together with people and in front of them, in front of the congregation of people who worship God, I'm going to worship with them. We're going to get together. And we're going to praise God. Now I said earlier, there's this teaching technique that Psalm 111 has that each line of the psalm starts with a different letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Uh, this first one begins with the letter Aleph, which is actually not really the equivalent of our letter A. Letter Aleph is actually something that we're English. We cannot pronounce this letter. It's one of those really weird. It almost sounds like it's a it's a belch coming from the deepest part of your throat. Nobody who speaks English could possibly do this letter. But that's the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. This phrase begins with that. I'm going to try to be creative here. Okay, so hang on with me. We're going to start with the letter A. What's this trying to tell us? Trying to tell us to assemble, to come together to gather together as the people of God to worship together because that's going to be the starting place that's going to lead us to this fear of God, which is the beginning of wisdom. Come together as an assembly of the people of God. Continues. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Oh, it's great to gather together as people of God to assemble. You know what's occasionally important? In this, in this book, mine, does, mine, mine doesn't have a cover at the moment. I have multiple copies of this song. This is just the one I leave at the pulpit. I don't actually read this particular copy through the week. But it's handy to leave at the pulpit. It's my Bible. One of many. Actually, these days, mostly, I'm reading it on my iPad. Studied by all who delight in him. We assemble. We also, you know, there's this book we should occasionally pick up as believers. Bible. Bible is a very simple word. It means library in the original Greek language. That's all it means. It's not a special word. It just means library. Gathering of books. There's 66 books that are put in our little library. We pull them out, we read them occasionally, right? I should read them daily. It's the work of God given to us. It's a statement of God to our lives. Study the works of God as given in His Word. Full of splendor and majesty is His work. And his righteousness endures forever. I kind of look at this. The psalmist, we're not entirely sure who the psalmist is here, who wrote it, because this is one of the late psalms. But, but the idea is here, he's thinking about the splendor of God, he's thinking about the majesty of God that we see in the works that we find in his Bible, that we find even in the way that we live as live our lives. We see him at work. We hear testimonies from people. We hear people talk about how God is at work. We open our eyes and see how God is at work in our own lives. And we find his splendor, his majesty, his righteousness that is alive forever. And as we're doing that, we're contemplating what God is doing. We're contemplating. Thinking about it. Now if I wasn't trying so hard to come up with ABC, I probably would have said thinking about it or something, but contemplating it. I'm not trying to sound like I've got big words. I just needed to see. We contemplate it. Think about what God is doing. Not just God did something good and we forget about it, but I, I spent time. Boy, what need the way that God answered my further? God brought a healing. That God showed his care for me in this way. That at just the right time, when I needed most, somebody knocked on my door and said, how are you doing? 
those moments where God works, I contemplate. You know, maybe this was not just a coincidence or something. This is God. His cause is wondrous works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and merciful. I'm going to shade here and use two words, but it's deeds remembered. It's kind of related to the last one. <clears throat> Contemplate what God's doing as he does good things. I remember those deeds that he has done. We tend to have short memories, as people don't mean really short. We tend to forget the things that God has done. You know what? It is a good practice, and I'm not always really good at this. But I know people who are, but when God answers prayer, write it down. Go back. Look at it again. To write down good things. Sometimes to even celebrate annually the good things that we certainly do that with certain things in the Christian life, don't we? We celebrate his birth. We celebrate his death and his resurrection. There are certain things we remember to celebrate. Maybe even sometimes there's personal things we need to do. I know some individuals who have struggled over the years with alcohol. And they come to the place, they hit rock bottom, they step away. Don't drink anymore. Have an annual party to celebrate the last time they had a drink. I think that's a good practice. Obviously, it's a dry party. But to have moments like that and say, do you know what, God, help me over, you know, celebrate it, what God has done. We celebrate birthdays, we celebrate anniversaries. Those are other times to remember the good things of God. That's why I'm trying to get this habit of praying for people at, on the week of their birthday and saying thank you for what God has done. I think those are important moments to remember that God is active. God is active. He provides food for those who fear Him. This might be the one thing that we do occasionally remember. In my house at least, we always say grace before a meal. Maybe you do as well. It's good to say thank you. It's good to express thanks. Express things. Nothing is for me. We tend to think, you know, hey, yeah. hard for my food. I've grown it in my garden myself. I might have worked hard to raise the money that I could buy it. But you know what? Apart from God, there is no good that we have. And it is good to remember food is a good example of something to always say thankful, thank you for. There are many other things we can, but here's the example that, that we're given in the psalm. Remember to say thank you when you've eaten. Because it's a symbol of what God has given us. And maybe it leads us to be thankful in other areas. Express things. He remembers his covenant forever. What's his covenant? Covenant is the way, the framework in which we relate to God. In the Old Testament, there's a couple of different covenants, a couple of different ways in which it's expressed. It finally comes down to Moses. Remember him from the Old Testament? Very least from some of the movies that have been made about him. Comes along, the people are in slavery in Egypt. He comes down, he says, let my people go. We know that part of it. But then they get out to the desert. And Moses goes up on Mount Sinai. All people are left below. God says, okay, here's how this is going to work. I'm going to give you a land. I'm going to give you the opportunity to follow me. I want you to be a light to the nations. And here's how you're going to do it. You're going to live this way. And give them the Ten Commandments. And then he frames in a whole, you know, four whole books that are basically the laws that explain Okay, here's how the Ten Commandments kind of work. Here's how I want you to be. Here's how I want you to live. New Testament comes along and says, okay, do you know what? You didn't do very well. Now you quite managed to live perfectly. So here's the new covenant 
that I have for you, and it's in the blood of Jesus, it's found in forgiveness. It's based on grace. It's based on love. I'm going to bring you to this place where you can know hope. Not because you try hard, but just because I love you. And I almost needed that first part to say, do you know what? None of us can do it on our own. We need the forgiveness of God. That is his covenant. And it's a forever covenant. It's forever. And we celebrate his eternal covenant that God is faithful, and because God is faithful, I have the guarantee of salvation in him. He has shown his people the power of his works in giving them the inheritance of the nations. Okay. If I'm going through this alphabetically, I'm going to be honest with you, this one and maybe the next one, I, I kind of had to be a little creative. I was trying to think, how is G going to fit with this? Well, I got me thinking, do you know what this really is about? This is talking about the inheritance that we have. Okay, the inheritance that we have in the new covenant is we have this inheritance of the eternal kingdom of God. We think of the promises of heavenly places. What are the physical ways we think about it? Well, streets paved with gold, which isn't exactly how it phrases it because they're... They're... they're it's described as clear gold, and I'm not sure entirely what clear gold means. But anyways, it's something to describe of immense beauty and wealth, and, and it's our eternal promise, so we're going to go with gold. That kind of fits with you. That's God's eternal promise for us. Not gold in the sense of wealth, <coughs> but our eternal <coughs> home. Beyond this life, is one of incredible beauty. An unimaginable place. That's where God's taken us. That's our inheritance. And he's taking us somewhere great. It's really needed to be one letter later because that could just be heavenly home or something. But didn't quite work out that way. But the idea is there. We're to be heavenly minded. God has taken you somewhere. This world is not the final statement. This world is not where he's taken. He's taken us somewhere better. And we need to keep in mind that heavenly mindedness. That God is taking us somewhere. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever. We need to follow what God is doing, to try to see his works. We may never fully appreciate what exactly it is God is doing in our lives, but he's doing something. You know what? God doesn't take his places by accident. He's at work. He's at work. And I said with this letter, I had trouble coming up with an H. Okay, this might be a stretch. But the happenings of God are analyzed by us. His happenings analyzed. We look, we may not figure out exactly what God's doing, but we look for the little things to maybe understand a little bit better. We don't have to understand God. God's much bigger than us. We don't always have to see that he was at work at this moment. We don't always have to understand that he did this exactly. But it doesn't hurt to look around and try to figure out what, what was God up to there. Because sometimes we discover the little lessons that he has for us. I promise you, God is at work. God's at work. And we follow what God is doing To be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. This is the call now then to us. That we act faithfully and upright. And my I statement is this. I obey. I obey. I am just called to be obedient. To step out in faith 
and do it once. You know, sometimes it's amazing how much our faith grows when we step out and we do things in His name. Maybe things that we never thought we could. Man, that, that, that's quite remarkable. When I step out in faith and I say, do you know what? I will do this. Maybe that I'll, I'll teach children church or I'll, I'll or, or I've got a, somebody that I know is hurting and I go out and I help them. That God put something in my mind saying, do you know what? You should try this. I should do this. We kind of dismiss it right away and say, no, there's somebody else to do that. No, it's not my place. <laughs> you know, when we step out and do something we didn't think we could in the name of Jesus, when we obey, those are the moments when God teaches us the most and we learn the most to be thankful. And sometimes, boy, is it hard. God tells you, you know what, you should, you should go talk to somebody about me, or you should, you should just offer, that person's hurting, you should say, can I pray for you? And then we actually pray for them. Sometimes it's really hard to do. When we obey, God is taking us. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Redemption is the buying back of a people. Going back to that Old Testament idea in the time of Moses, God coming along and buying the people out of slavery. How does he do it? It's with his power and his might. How does he buy us back from slavery? It's with the blood of Jesus. He sent redemption to his people. What happens when he does that? When we come to Jesus and we are redeemed, we are then made right in the eyes of the judge. So therefore, I came up with the J, justify. Now, I think in that particular font, the I and the J look exactly alike. Oh, well. It's a J. Justify. We are justified. We are made right in the eyes of God. And celebrate that. And we remember the salvation that he's brought us. You know how grateful it makes us when salvation is brought for us? And then, do you know what the psalmist has to do? He's thinking about this salvation that he has, and he gets excited. Holy and awesome is his name. And it's even our translation puts an exclamation mark behind it. Hebrew didn't have exclamation marks, but that's okay. He's excited. He's excited. Holy and awesome is his name of the one who has brought me salvation, and we should know excitement. No excitement. Be excited about your God. Be excited about the one who has brought you salvation. Be excited about the one who has given himself up for you. And he continues still excited when he cries out. His praise endures forever. Forever. Okay. One word. Maybe this, maybe my last letter that I'm going to put up here is going to be when you're going to learn a new word. Who wants to learn a new word today? Because it's a really old word. It's actually Latin. But it gets passed into English. And if you read the King James every once in a while, I think it's in there three times, you might find it. And it's this. Laud forever. L-A-U-D. It's a very simple word. It just means Praise. You can remember that one, by the way. You have to remember it at Christmas time. Because when at Christmas time, uh, probably Christmas Eve or something like that, we're going to sing a song called What Child Is This? Where it says, haste, haste, which means go quick, to bring him Laud, the babe of Mary. And Laud is just means worship. So go quick to bring the Christ child. Worship is what did that... that old Christmas carol is what it means. For us today, worship and keep worshiping God. The greatest way to keep in mind all the things that God has for us is to continue to worship Him. See, we're learning to fear God. And it's learning to see the world and life as the Creator sees it. The way that He intended 
for us to live. It is a change in our perspective on life. Often, we seem to think that much of the Christian life is emotional or automatic. But as I go through these, it is work, it is study, it is struggle, it is practice. It's like anything else in life that is worthwhile. It takes work. But as we do, we learn to see a God who's desperately in love with us and has value. It changes everything. There's a lady by the name of Helen Level. She was uh, originally started, she was a music critic at a Portland newspaper. Eventually, she decided she wanted to write her own music, and she, she started to do that in the 1920s. She hooked up with an evangelist by the name of Billy Sunday. His name might be famous, but kind of Billy Graham of the 1920s. Went and spoke to crowds of thousands and thousands. He started to, she started to write songs for him. One day she sat down and she found a tract written by a missionary or to Muslims in Algeria, and she read some words that inspired one of the over 500 songs she eventually wrote. Most of them we don't know anymore. There is one that we occasionally sing. And she sat down with a pamphlet, thinking about they've got this, this evangelistic meeting with Billy Sunday coming up, and she needed a new song, because they had to come up with new songs every single time they got together. And she read these words written by this missionary to Algeria. And it was all about making difficult choices. was this. Turn your soul's vision to Jesus. And look. And look at him. And a strange dimness will come over all that is apart from him. In other words, look to him. And everything that's different from him will fall away. And she read those words and she ended up writing a hymn. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. That kind of is the crux of what we're after today. Do the work to turn your eyes upon Jesus. Let's join together in the song.